All right, welcome everyone to our presentation today about parathyroid disease and treatment. My name is John McElligot, Executive Director of the Maricopa County Medical Society. MCMS is the oldest um, medical society in the state of Arizona. We fight for physicians in the fourth most populous county in America, Maricopa County, and now has five medical schools and about 13,000 practicing physicians. Our mission here at MCMS is to promote excellence in the quality of care and the health of the community and to represent and serve its members by acting as a strong collective physician voice. For more information about MCMS, please visit mcmsonline.com. Um, you can also join the Medical Society by clicking the Join to Renew button that's on there as well. Today's event has commercial support from MICA, the exclusive provider of medical professional liability coverage for members of MCMS. We thank MICA very much for their continued support of physicians throughout the Valley and throughout Arizona. A quick note about CME. This activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with the accreditation requirements and policies of the Arizona Medical Association through the joint providership of Moore Foundation and Maricopa County Medical Society. Moore Foundation is accredited by ARMA to provide continuing medical education for physicians. Moore Foundation designates this enduring material uh, activity for a maximum of 1.0 AMA PRA category one credits. Physicians should only claim credit that is commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. Um, this is an enduring activity because we are recording this session, which we're posting on to YouTube so that uh, physicians can come back to this later on for the upcoming three years to see the uh, materials. After this presentation, we'll be sending some information to the people who are doing the live discussion. And if you're seeing this recording, then there'll be notes, um, show notes on YouTube about how you can access a survey to get the additional credit. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Deva Boone. Dr. Boone has dedicated her career to the understanding and treatment of parathyroid disease combining compassion, knowledge, and experience to provide world-class care for all patients. After obtaining her medical degree at Cornell Medical College, Dr. Boone completed a general surgery residency in New York City, an endocrine surgery fellowship in Chicago, Illinois. She then subspecialized in parathyroid surgery. She joined the Norman Parathyroid Center in 2014, where she performed over 3,600 parathyroid operations and consulted with thousands more patients with suspected calcium and parathyroid abnormalities. Very few surgeons worldwide have treated more parathyroid patients than Dr. Deva Boone. At the Norman Center, she also served as the medical director from 2017 to 2020, while continuing to operate on about 500 to 600 parathyroid patients annually. In 2020, she left to open the Southwest Parathyroid Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Dr. Boone is a frequent speaker on parathyroid disease she enjoys teaching both patients and other physicians about calcium, vitamin D, and parathyroids. In 2017, she was the primary author of one of the most significant parathyroid papers, which was a review of over 20,000 cases of, hyper, of primary hyperparathyroidism. If you want to contact Dr. Boone, you can visit her practice at southwestparathyroid.com. Dr. Boone, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, we'll turn the floor over to you, but just want to say thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I have a bit of laryngitis, so hopefully my voice will make it the entire presentation. I've, uh, I've been saving it up all day. Okay, so. Great. And, uh, yeah, let me turn over the power, uh, hosting power to you. So uh, please confirm you got that. And once you do, you can start uh, sharing your screen. Okay, great. Looks like I can. Folks, if you have questions or comments as we move along, <laughs> Uh, please add them into the chat and we'll get back to those later on. Thank you. Yes, great. So, um, so hopefully this will be interesting and interactive. Um, if you have any urgent questions, you can always, always uh, stop me, raise your hand on here. Um, but uh, I'm going to be talking about parathyroid disease and treatment. This is obviously my favorite topic because all I do is parathyroid disease. Um, and I, as he mentioned, I've been doing this now for eight years, right, where I solely treat parathyroid disease um, with some thyroid under duress. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to talk about sort of what I've learned in treating all these patients um, and then give you some also 
uh, ways of describing it to your patients as well. So things that uh, the way that I explain it to patients, because I spend a lot of time um, talking to patients, doing these kind of videos for patients on Facebook uh, and, and YouTube. And so I can kind of explain it to them and tell you how I explain it to them as well. Okay. So I have no relevant disclosures, um, no financial relationships, no unlabeled uses of anything. And really the objective here is to uh, make sure everybody knows how to diagnose primary hyperparathyroidism and understands the basics of the pathophysiology of it, including vitamin D, which is a very hot topic among a lot of people online. And, uh, and uh, so I wanna make sure I cover that and, and how it's related to calcium and PTH. And then just talk about how parathyroid disease normally presents and what you can expect in your patients. And then finally, when you can, um, when you should or can refer to surgery. So the parathyroid glands, I like to introduce these glands as the simplest endocrine glands. Um, the other endocrine glands in the body tend to be very complicated. They have, they have multiple uh, hormones that they're regulating and they're, they're going in waves or doing crazy things, but the parathyroid glands are really, really simple because they're doing essentially one thing. They're doing just one thing really. And they're doing it with just one hormone. So you can't get more basic than that. Um, what is the one thing they're doing? They're regulating serum calcium levels. And the one hormone is called parathyroid hormone. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, sometimes there are situations where the disease is not that straightforward, but the understanding the basics is pretty easy because it is doing one thing. So if you think about the parathyroid glands, you really just wanna go back to what are they doing? What are they trying to do? And are they doing their job correctly? So why is calcium important? And I always start with this with patients because um, patients, when they think about calcium, primarily they're thinking about bones. And of course, calcium is necessary to strengthen the bones. And if you don't have enough calcium, then you can end up with severe bone abnormalities. Um, but the parathyroid glands are not regulating bone calcium. And this is something I emphasize to patients too. The parathyroid glands really essentially don't care about your bone calcium. They're willing to steal calcium from the bones in order to get the blood calcium back up. So what they're really regulating is your blood calcium. Um, okay, so why is calcium important? And why do we have organs that just regulate calcium? Uh, which is pretty impressive, right? We, there's nothing else in our body like that, that, you know, a single organ for a single mineral. So why is calcium important? Well, I'm going to go back a little bit of basic science here from medical school, but uh, this isn't on any of the CME questions. Um, but here is the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons at the uh, synapse. So um, you can see these two neurons, they're communicating. Um, and you'll remember there's a bunch of neurotransmitters, there's little vesicles here. Uh, but recall that calcium is an essential part of this. And this, this uh, aspect of calcium and its role in the nervous system may account for a lot of the symptoms that people actually feel with this. So calcium is really important for your nervous system. Here is at the cell membrane. So looking at the individual cells on the bottom here is inside the cell and the purple up top is outside the cell. Uh, and you'll see, you see these G proteins and I don't remember what all these other things stand for, but of course I do know that calcium is pretty important for this. So um, lots of things you don't need to remember exactly, but remember that calcium is here and it's important both on that extracellular um, aspect of the, of the receptor. And then here where you have these internal calcium stores that are ready for, uh, for cell signaling within the cells. And finally, the clotting cascade. So that we all remember um, these series of clotting factors that have to interact in order for you to get a stable fibrin clot. Um, well, calcium is there too. So coagulation factor four actually is calcium. It used to be called coagulation factor four, and now we just know that it's calcium. So that's important for blood clotting. Um, bonus question, I, I, you, don't have to, you don't have to chime in with the answer, but bonus question, uh, why is citrate used in red blood cell storage? So when you get a bag of blood, um, you'll notice that the blood is not clotted. The reason it's not clotted is because it's got a lot of citrate in it. 
And that citrate um, binds to calcium and prevents the blood from clotting. So that's the primary role for citrate uh, in that red blood cell storage. Um, this is why, by the way, if you get a massive transfusion and you get a lot of blood cell, a lot of packed red blood cells, uh, people also get a really high dose of citrate, and that can actually cause very dangerous hypocalcemia. So uh, you may need to start giving someone uh, IV calcium if you're doing a massive transfusion protocol. Not that um, not that many people on this call are doing that, but <laughs> but that is something to note and it's an interesting fact about red blood cells. Okay, so why is calcium important? Well, bones, obviously it strengthens the bones and the bones are a major storage of calcium, but it's really important for central nervous system signaling, for muscle contraction. So I didn't cover that, but at the, at the, um, at the muscle where the nerve you know, goes to the muscle, you have the same reaction that you have at that presynaptic postsynaptic terminal um, in signal transduction pathways within cells and then finally coagulation. Okay, so calcium is important for all of these things. And this is why your body keeps the calcium in a very tight range. Um, and the calcium level varies with age. So as you get older, calcium levels tend to drop a little. So if we're looking at young children and teenagers, they tend to have higher calcium levels. And then as you get older, they tend to drop with time. Uh, notice I made a line at the 10 level here because that's where usually by the time you're around 40, people start to have calcium levels that are mostly in the nines. Now you can have calcium levels in the nines when you're younger, but when you get older, having calcium levels in the tens is no longer normal. So once you're 50, 60, 70, having a calcium that's above 10.0 uh, in milligrams per deciliter is, is getting into that high range. Um, but if you're somewhere in your 20s, you can have slightly lower calcium levels. Um, why this happens in terms of the cell signaling and why uh, why we can, why our bodies are able to handle that, I, I don't have any idea, um, but I do know that we see this. We see these calcium levels drop with age and then kind of stabilize uh, in the, after around 40 to be in the mid to high nines generally. Okay, calcium homeostasis. I won't bore you with this entire slide, but just note that the parathyroid glands again are the simplest endocrine glands. Um, because they're right here and they've got this simple feedback pathway. So parathyroid glands, they make PTH. They're stimulated by low calcium and then they're inhibited by high calcium. Um, it's very simple. Uh, and the parathyroid hormone, again, is just trying to get that calcium up. You can think of those parathyroid glands doing that one thing, regulating calcium. So parathyroid hormone wants to get the calcium up. It'll go to the bones um, just a nice little drawing of a bone there. <laughs> it'll go to the bones, it'll take calcium out, uh, and then it goes to the kidneys where it will uh, increase the reabsorption of calcium, but also activate vitamin D. This is something that I want everybody to remember, um, not necessarily from this slide, but I want you to remember the PTH interaction with vitamin D, because this is something that is often forgotten. Um, doctors often have forgotten it and patients, patients have never learned it, but uh, but this is what happens. So parathyroid hormone is stimulating that one alpha hydroxylase to convert the inactive form of vitamin D to the active form. And of course the active form of vitamin D then goes to the intestines and increases intestinal absorption. But this is, this is really, really important and I'll, I'll bring it up later um, so everybody will know to uh, make note of it later. Okay, so this is how I explain it to patients. They are the thermostats for calcium. That is all they do. Um, and, I, and this is how I explain it to patients. Basically, I say, look, think about your, um, your thermostat in the winter for your house. Uh, you set it to 70 degrees. If the temperature drops below that, the thermostat will sense that. It kicks on the heating, which brings the temperature back up. If the temperature goes too far, so if it's now 75 degrees, it will sense that, turn the heating off, allow it to go back to 70, and then keep it in that kind of tight range. And, and it does that constantly throughout the day so that you keep your temperature in a normal range. That is exactly what parathyroid glands do. So they have this tight range for calcium that they're trying to keep the calcium level in. And if the calcium level drops too low, what they'll do is they'll make more hormone because that's all they can do. Remember they can do one thing, which is 
make hormone or not make hormone. They have this basic uh, decision tree, <laughs> very basic decision tree. So they make hormone or they don't make hormone. If calcium's too low, they make more hormone. If calcium's too high, they make less hormone. Um, and they're doing this throughout the day so that your calcium level in your body stays within a pretty tight range uh, for the entire day. Regardless of whether you ate a lot of calcium or didn't eat a lot of calcium that day, your calcium level should stay pretty constant. So what happens when there's a problem? The big problem or the most common problem that we see with the parathyroids is primary hyperparathyroidism. And that is when you've got this rogue parathyroid gland or parathyroid tumor that is not responding like an appropriate thermostat. So it's not being suppressed by calcium. It continues to make hormone even though the calcium level is too high. So the classic picture is your calcium levels rising, your parathyroid hormone remains normal or elevated. Um, and despite the fact that your calcium is too high, the parathyroid gland doesn't turn off. This is essentially the same as if you, the heating's on in your house and it's 90 degrees. You know something's wrong with your thermostat because the heating should not be on at 90 degrees. Okay. So that's classic disease. So, so primary hyperparathyroidism then is fairly easy to diagnose in most people. Most people are going to have a high calcium and an inappropriate PTH. And the by inappropriate, I mean inappropriate for the calcium level. Sometimes patients will come to me and, <clears throat> um, and they will say, they'll give me their PTH level and they'll ask me if they have parathyroid disease. Well, I have no idea because I need their calcium level to know. So the first thing is look at the calcium. If that calcium is high, so if I have a 50 year old with a calcium of 10.4, that is high. That patient could have a PTH of 50, which is within normal range. The lab will call it normal, but that's inappropriate uh, because again, that is the, the PTH is, is the heat in your house. That is the heat's still on, even though it's 90 degrees. The heat may be on low, but it doesn't matter. It shouldn't be on at all. You shouldn't have any PTH being produced uh, or rather you should only have a very little amount being produced if your calcium level is high for some other reason. So if you see a PTH level that's in that normal range with a high calcium, that is diagnostic uh, for primary hyperparathyroidism. And just to note about these levels, what is considered high. Um, I am considering in adults over the age of 40, over 10.0 is generally high. Now, this is not an absolute. So you don't turn 40 and then magically your, your calcium level drops. They tend to, it tends to drop slowly over time so that most people, by the time they get to 40, will have calcium levels in the nines. There are going to be some people who will still have calcium levels of 10.1 or 10.2, and they're 40 years old, and that's okay. It will likely drop. Um, that, when I look at calcium levels, I, I really pay attention to the age because a calcium of 10.1, as I said, in a 40-year-old could be high, could just be that that's them and it's still dropping. Uh, if I see a 10.1 in an 80-year-old, that's most likely primary hyperparathyroidism because at that point, they really tend to not have calcium levels uh, that are above 10.0. And then under 40, I haven't really talked about, but younger adults can have higher calcium levels. So a teenager can have a calcium level in the, in the high tens. Um, people in their 20s tends to drop, but they can have 10.5, 10.6. Um, when you get to your 30s, even, you can have calcium levels in the low tens, and all those are normal. Um, now, you can confirm this if you're concerned about it. What I like to do is I get all the history, so I like to go back and get as many calcium levels of, as I can, and if you see that, you know, you have a 40-year-old and their calcium is 10.1, not really sure, go back and look at their calcium levels from before, because if they had calcium levels of 9.7 for the 10 years prior to that, and now it's 10.1, that's more concerning because it shouldn't be going up at that point. It really should be kind of stabilizing in the nines of that. Okay. So, but other than that, it's most of the time fairly straightforward, high calcium, inappropriate PTH, which is normal or high PTH. Okay. So how do you screen for hyperparathyroidism? The, the best thing to do is look at calcium levels. <laughs> um, that's, that's really the hallmark of the disease and what is going to guide you. Now there is something called normocalcemic where the calcium levels are completely normal. 
um, and the parathyroid hormone levels are high. And the way that you know to screen for them is that they have significant issues that lead you to think that there might be a pro parathyroid problem, such as really severe bone loss, uh, especially in the forearm or the hip that can't be explained by anything else. Um, and uh, and those, are, those are generally the people diagnosed with normal calcemic. But for most people, look at the calcium levels. So um, I don't know if there's anywhere, anywhere for you to vote, but who, would, who of these patients should be evaluated for primary hyperparathyroidism? So have a 12-year-old girl with a calcium of 10.8, 25-year-old um, man with a calcium of 10.2, 45-year-old calcium of 10.8, or an 80 year old with a calcium of 10.2. Um, and note that I'm not saying specifically that any of these people necessarily have parathyroid disease, but that some of them uh, you will want to actually screen for. Um, okay, so I have an answer. This is great, a little chat here. Um, so D, yes. So for D, definitely I would say an 80 year old with a calcium of 10.2 is uh, very suggestive for primary hyperparathyroidism. The other one is C. Uh, so a 45-year-old woman with a calcium 10.8 is also very suggestive for primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, at 45, really a calcium of 10.8 is too high. The other two likely have normal labs. So 12-year-old girls, 12-year-old of any, any gender can have a calcium of 10.8. Uh, and a 25-year-old, really a 10.2 is probably normal. So the two people I think likely have primary hyperparathyroidism are C and D. Those are the ones I would then want to check a calcium, a PTH, um, look at their vitamin D, do all of that. C and D. Okay, so let's play who has primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, all right, I'm gonna go through uh, some pretty kind of classic scenarios that I see. This is what I do all the time. So I find it fun and hopefully all of you will as well. Um, so I have a 75 year old woman with a calcium of 10.3 and a pH of 54 and a vitamin D level, uh, again, the inactive level of 25. Uh, is this primary hyperparathyroidism? Everybody type yes or no. I'll, I'll give everybody the answer. Yes, this is pretty classic uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. So, oh good, okay, everybody, everybody knows it, good. So this is kind of the classic presentation. So 75 year olds really shouldn't have calcium levels of 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, uh, and then a PTH level that's in that normal range, but again, inappropriate. Uh, this is kind of classic primary hyperparathyroidism. Okay, what about this one? Um, slightly younger, calcium's 10.4, which again is a little bit high for that age. PTH is 70 and the vitamin D level is 10. Um, I put this question up for a reason, and that is because the question I often get, right, so this is what I see. Um, the, the question I get is, could the low vitamin D be causing the high calcium? That is the number one question. Um, and it's a good question, and I like that people are thinking about the vitamin D, but I want you to go back to the thing that I said was so important before, uh, go back to that reaction. So here's that. Here's the vitamin D we measure. That's the the 25 hydroxy is the one that we measure. That's the inactive vitamin D. Um, it gets converted in the kidneys to that active form, the 125 dihydroxy, which actually we can measure, but we don't because it tends to be a little bit less stable in the body. So we we really measure this 25 hydroxy form. And for people who don't have parathyroid disease, this is probably the best way to assess their overall vitamin D status. So for you and me, assuming you don't have parathyroid disease, this is the, that 25 hydroxy is the best way to get a sense of what your vitamin D status is like overall. That number is inactive or that number is inaccurate for people with parathyroid disease. Why? Because they have too much PTH and the PTH is stimulating that conversion. So they end up with high active forms of vitamin D and low inactive forms of vitamin D. Um, so why is that important? Well, when you just look at the vitamin D, uh, there's often a knee jerk reaction to prescribe vitamin D. And so a lot of people are prescribed vitamin D and the doctor doesn't even look at the calcium level. Um, and I encourage patients always, you know, if you have a, if you're diagnosed with a low vitamin D and it's a little bit of a surprise, go and look at your calcium level. Um, 
if your calcium level is high, but your vitamin D 25 hydroxy is low, that is very consistent with primary hyperparathyroidism and you should have your PTH checked. Okay, so this is super important. The primary hyperparathyroidism causes the low vitamin D. Low vitamin D can, act, can definitely cause secondary hyperparathyroidism, uh, but with secondary hyperparathyroidism, the calcium level is going to be low. So for this patient, this is pretty classic primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the high calcium, normal or high PTH, and then the low to low normal vitamin D. And I say low to low normal vitamin D, but really if you check that active form, it will be high in a lot of patients. So this is primary hyperparathyroidism, um, so proven otherwise. And, uh, and, and if you give them vitamin D, you might see the number improve. You might see the calcium level, it will probably stay the same or go up. Uh, the PTH may get suppressed by it, actually, uh, but you're not going to fix this. But the real clue that this is not secondary hyperparathyroidism is the high calcium. The calcium is 10.4. Um, this is not secondary hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid glands are very sensitive to calcium. Uh, they do respond to low calcium. They do sometimes make more hormone in response to low, cal in low vitamin D, rather, uh, but they are much more sensitive to actual calcium levels. Okay. 53-year-old with an 8.9, a pH of 93, and a vitamin D of 25. This is definitely high. Is this primary hyperparathyroidism? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, so no, this is that's a low calcium level. Um, the even the lab might say that 8.9 is normal. You'll find that the lab actually has this very wide range of normal, and it'll call anything from 8.6 to 10.4 normal. Uh, but really, most people have calcium levels in the nines, and when it drops down to the eights, they often get secondary hyperparathyroidism. So, just a comment on secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, we all know we all know about renal failure. So, patients on dialysis they get secondary hyperparathyroidism. They get very impressive secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, they can get PTH levels in the thousands. Um, but I don't see, but so I see a lot though of secondary hyperparathyroidism that is non-renal based and that is from malabsorption. And a lot of you probably see these patients as well because there is a, there's some very common things that happen like gastric bypass. Uh, if you have, a, have patients with gastric bypasses, likely a lot of them have a mild form of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, they do not absorb calcium as well as everybody else, and they will never absorb calcium as well as everyone else. And so their parathyroid glands are continually stimulated. So they end up, people with gastric bypass tend to end up with, uh, with a you know, mildly elevated PTH level chronically. Um, but even anything, chronic diarrhea, so celiac disease, Crohn's disease, anything where things are moving through really quickly and you have trouble absorbing, absorbing nutrients, then calcium is going to be affected. Severe vitamin D deficiency. Uh, recall what vitamin D does, which is it helps the intestines absorb calcium. So a severe deficiency is going to cause a problem with absorbing calcium. Um, and then any other operation on the stomach or duodenum. So if somebody's had a Whipple, uh, uh, they've actually, you know, they've, they've, they've had essentially that bypass. Um, if they've had multiple small bowel resections, anything where they've removed a lot of the duodenum or the stomach. And then finally, one that I see often and more often now, um, and I don't know why I'm seeing it more often now or if it's just I'm noticing it more, but in the last few years, um, I get a lot more people with renal calcium leak. Uh, and here's how these patients present. Th these patients, uh, this is number three here, they often present with kidney stones and a high PTH. And the a urologist is often the one to point it out. So the urologist will say, okay, you've gotten these recurrent kidney stones. I'll check a PTH level thinking, you know, primary hyperparathyroidism, the PTH is high. Um, and they don't always check the calcium or look at the calcium, but the calcium is often is low in these patients. So what's happening is the kidneys are releasing too much calcium. It's leaking, basically. You're leaking calcium into your urine, even though your blood calcium level is low. So you have high urine calcium and low blood calcium. Um, and because all that calcium is going through your kidneys, you end up with kidney stones. Uh, and because the calcium is being lost, you end up with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So your parathyroid glands, remember, they don't, they don't care about anything but blood calcium. So if that blood calcium is low, 
they just make more hormone. They just turn, turn out more hormones. You end up with low blood calcium, high urine calcium, and a high PTH. That's renal calcium leak. It's treated with medications. Um, if you if you can catch it in time, you can you can treat it with uh, usually with thiazide diuretics um, as the first line therapy to kind of stop the kidneys from releasing all of that uh, calcium into the urine. And I also tell people if they're on a high salt diet to uh, to stop that because salt pulls calcium into the urine. So sometimes a, a high salt diet can do it. Okay. So back to my thing. Oh, another bonus question. Where does most active absorption of calcium occur? This is actually important. Um, so a lot of nutrients, if you remember back to med school and somebody asked you, where is something absorbed? You usually said the terminal ileum, right? Because that's where a lot of stuff is absorbed is the terminal ileum. That's actually not true for calcium. Well, it is, it's absorbed in the terminal ileum as well, but the most, pl the place of active absorption occurs in the duodenum, uh, which is why the gastric bypass and the Whipple are so significant for calcium absorption because the gastric bypass is not bypassing the, the terminal ileum. So a lot of stuff is still being able to be absorbed, uh, but it's bi bypassing completely the, uh, the duodenum. So, so here's what happens with the gastric bypass. So you're, um, you're taking that duodenum, this is where that active absorption is occurring and you're essentially cutting it off. So food's not going through there, nothing's going through there. Uh, you're taking the area where that most active absorption occurs and completely bypassing it. So uh, this is why calcium is affected more than certain other things in gastric bypass patients because, because of that role, the role of the duodenum. Okay, um, just a note. So if you have gastric bypass patients, a lot of times they will have uh, elevated PTH levels and low calcium levels. And, and really they should all be on calcium supplementation. So another note is really, they, they really need to take it because they're not gonna be able to get enough from their diet. Okay, so no, so this is, this, is, this looks like a gastric bypass patient with secondary hyperparathyroidism. My goal with these patients is to keep their PTH under a hundred. So I start them on um, more aggressive calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Um, I really like calcium citrate and the chewable ones so that by the time it gets to their intestine, it's ready to be absorbed um, as opposed to some of those big pills where some people with loose stools report, you know, just seeing the pill come right back out. Um, whereas if you chew it, as soon as it hits their intestine, it's, it's ready to go. So uh, I encourage people to get a chewable calcium citrate uh, for that. Okay, next one, an 80 year old with a calcium of 11, a PTH of 12 and a vitamin D of 30. What does everyone think? Is this primary hyperparathyroidism? No, yeah, no, no, okay. Yeah, the answer is no, no. So that PTH is low. These are the sad cases. Um, when I see this, what I'm usually thinking is they may have cancer. So <clears throat> this is when you have to look at the other causes of high calcium. So cancer, um, there's, there's two different ways in which it can cause high calcium, the PTHRP mediated. So like the squamous cell carcinomas, um, and this can easily be checked. You check a PTHRP um, and then the local osteolytic. So if you've got multiple myeloma or widespread metastatic uh, bone disease, um, you can have uh, you can have calcium release from that. So uh, this is why when you're checking for sort of high calcium and you have that that suppressed PTH, you do want to check a PTHRP. You screen for multiple myeloma. Um, you make sure you're screening for other cancers. Though if they really have metastatic breast cancer that's so distributed throughout their bones that they've got high calcium, then they probably already know about it. But just in case, <laughs> um, and then some other causes. There are other causes of high calcium. Oops, I wasn't supposed to hit that. Um, there are other causes of high calcium. So sarcoidosis uh, is an interesting one. And if you read the literature, it says that it can actually look a lot like primary hyperparathyroidism in that the PTH isn't necessarily suppressed. However, in the cases I've had, it was suppressed. So uh, the calcium level was high and the PTH level was, was pretty clearly on the low end and the person had very active sarcoidosis. So it wasn't, um, it, it, these things tend to be pretty significant disease. The sarcoidosis is usually pretty widespread if it's gonna cause high calcium. So oftentimes it's not the first sign of sarcoidosis, although theoretically it could be, 
Um, but you can you can screen for it by getting a, a uh, by getting imaging a, a chest X ray. If it's if it's that significant to cause high calcium, it's probably going to show up on a scan. I also check ACE levels. Uh, it's not perfect, not a perfect blood test for sarcoidosis, but it's something um, to screen for if you really can't figure out somebody's high calcium. Excess vitamin D supplementation. I see this so much now um, because people there there are people online advocating for very very high doses of vitamin D, and so um, I get patients coming to me with high calcium due to vitamin D, and I'll discuss that more in a minute. Um, certain medications. So the classic one people talk about is hydrochlorothiazide, which I had just mentioned in the last slide. Um, but hydrochlorothiazide does stop the kidneys from releasing so much calcium and theoretically can raise the blood calcium. In reality, most of the time it doesn't. Um, and most of the time, if you see a patient with high calcium on hydrochlorothiazide, it's probably primary hyperparathyroidism rather than the hydrochlorothiazide. But if this if the case isn't clear, then it makes sense to stop it and, and make sure. And then finally, familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia. This is a very tricky one. The labs will look exactly like they do for primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, the way that I screen for this is actually not, not immediately checking a urine calcium. Urine calcium is not very accurate. Um, and it just varies a lot. So it's not a very reliable test. The way, here's how I screen for FHH because I have had a, a you know, a lot of, I mean, I've had, treated a lot of patients. So I've seen a significant cases of, of FHH. Um, the way I screen for it is first, I ask about history, um, family history and personal history. So I look at people's labs as far back as they can go. And if someone says to me, I've had high calcium levels for 30 years, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, huh, that'd be really unusual for primary hyperparathyroidism. Not impossible, but unusual. So then if, I, if they actually could show me calcium levels from 30 years ago that are exactly the same as they are now, and then I look at their PTH level, and their PTH level is also um, exactly the same. So the PTH level hasn't gone up. It's, you know, PTH level's been 50 for the last 10 years. Their calcium level's been 10.5. Uh, between 10.2 and 10.8 for the last 30 years. Um, I'm very, very suspicious about something like FHH. In those patients, I will check uh, a urine cal 24 hour urine calcium. Um, and sometimes even if that urine calcium is, is not uh, 100% clear and usually, usually it's not, um, I, will get, I will get genetic testing on patients if I really uh, have a high suspicion. So that 30 years of high calcium. And then if they tell me, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know, all five of my brothers have high calcium. Um, so that was an actual clinic visit. Uh, a guy, was maybe in his 40s, he came with a calcium of, uh, of in the 10s, 10.6, um, high for his age. The PTH was also high in the 60s, maybe, you know, not, not extremely high. Uh, but I asked about the history, and he said two of his brothers had had parathyroid surgery, um, and the other three had high calcium but hadn't had surgery yet. <laughs> um, so I ended up getting all their history, and uh, uh, because you know, two of the brothers had already had surgery, I got their pre and post-op labs and they hadn't changed. So that's a pretty good sign that uh, this is a familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia without ever doing genetic testing. Uh, that's, that's a pretty clear case. So I always ask about family history and how long the, the calcium level has been high. That's really the best way to screen for FHH. Um, urine calcium is kind of a secondary thing because patients with primary hyperparathyroidism can have pretty low urine calcium levels. Um, especially early on, remember that parathyroid hormone stops the kidneys from releasing uh, calcium and, and, and increases the reabsorption. So you can actually get the parathyroid hormone pulling calcium back. Um, and then over time, most patients with primary hyperparathyroidism will have at some point um, either a high normal or a high urine calcium. But that's enough on FHH. That's rare enough that uh, we probably shouldn't spend any more time on it. Okay. So for back to our 80 year old woman, um, probably not. This is a case where you need to check everything else. Now, um, <clears throat> how young do you see it? Oh, for FHH, huh? You know, so nobody's come to me at a very young age with FHH unless they already, unless the family member has already been diagnosed. Um, I think that for most doctors, they're not even looking really at calcium until the patient's a little bit older. And then with FHH, uh, a lot of times you won't see particularly high calcium. You'll, you'll see like mid-10s, 
um, sometimes up to 11, but usually not 12, usually not the really, really impressive levels. Hold on. Um, so I don't have a good set of like kids with FHH because by the time I see them, they're usually adults and they, the family members are obviously adults already. Um, so <coughs> um, in theory, you should see it pretty young. You should see a high calcium level for their entire life. Sorry, I did mention the laryngitis. I was trying not to talk at all today so that I could save my voice, but well, hopefully I'll make it through. <clears throat> okay, um, one more note on this patient is that if you rule out everything else, this may still be primary hyperparathyroidism. And I have operated on people with PTH levels in the teens who had parathyroid tumors. I didn't, I did it under duress <laughs> only after ruling out everything else. I mean, I, I had them check everything. And finally the doctor called me up and said, look, I've done bone marrow biopsies. <laughs> I did all the tests. You I mean, you can't find anything. We go and operate. So I finally went and found a small tumor. So um, <clears throat> it does happen. It's uncommon. Uh, generally, if you see labs like this, uh, it's going to be something other than primary hyperparathyroidism. Okay. <clears throat> okay, next one. 28 year old with a 10.2, 47, 35. No, <clears throat> no, yeah, no. So this is, these are normal labs. 28 year old can have a 10.2, it's okay. Okay, how about these labs? This is, this is a trickier one. Say no. Um, so this is likely no. 42-year-old, 9.8 is perfectly normal. The PTH is a little bit high and the vitamin D is a little bit low. This is a case where I would say it's a mild PTH elevation from the low vitamin D or some absorption issue. So <clears throat> if you told me that this patient had a gastric bypass, but has been taking calcium supplements and vitamin D supplements religiously, this would be the picture. <coughs> Okay, how about this one? Put in there what is going on in this picture. <clears throat> yes. Okay, I'm glad everybody's picking up on the vitamin D. So vitamin D is high here. Uh, vitamin D, as I said before, it aids the intestines in absorbing calcium. So excess vitamin D will raise the calcium. And importantly, the vitamin D is not necessarily in the toxic range. Most labs will list a normal vitamin D from 30 to 100. Well, I see this happening where the vitamin D will cause a high calcium well before the vitamin D gets to 100, um, even when it's above 60. So vitamin D of 80, I think is too high um, and I get nervous about calcium. Now, <clears throat> There are people who take 5,000 units of vitamin D every day for years, and they're fine. Uh, but there are people who are going to take that for years, and they're going to end up with high calcium levels. So this looks like classic vitamin D over supplementation. Okay, final one. <clears throat> okay, any opinions on this one? 9.8150. Okay. I'll add that her now I said now I'll tell you her creatinine is totally normal. But I agree. If the creatinine, if, they, if her creatinine was high, I would say yeah, this looks like maybe a secondary process. But say say this, her creatinine is normal. Okay, so 
probably. This looks like normal calcium. Very good. Okay, somebody got the normal calcium. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so this is a person who looks like they have true normal calcemic. Um, oh, the gastric bypass is interesting. Um, <coughs> it could be. <clears throat> They can definitely get PTH levels of 150. However, you should see a calcium level that's lower for that. So if you if the calcium level were 9.2 and the PTH were 150, I would say that was a gastric bypass because um, that's what happens. They get these calcium levels consistently low. PTH gets very high. Um, but when the, P, when the calcium is 9.8, that's really inappropriate PTH to have at 150. And so if, they, if they've got normal renal function, then this is a true case of normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, I don't have a lot on normal calcemic um, because it's, uh, it's not the most common form. And most cases of normal calcemic that I see are not truly normal calcemic. So to summarize on diagnosing primary hyperparathyroidism, and I'll get back to normal calcemic. First, check the calcium level. If it's high, repeat it with a PTH level. Classic hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism is going to be a high calcium, a normal or high PTH, and a normal or low vitamin D. What about normal calcemic? Well, the thing I see with this, so the calcium has to truly be normal. Um, going back here, the things that I see, so I get a lot of patients, I get some patients referred to me for normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism, but the calcium level is not truly normal. So I, for example, <clears throat> The first patient, the 75-year-old with a calcium of 10.3, the lab might call 10.3 normal, but it's not. Um, that is high for a 75-year-old. So the PTH level, uh, for the, so the calcium level is high, PTH level is inappropriate. This is not normal calcemic. This is just classic primary hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> the other time that I get it is if the calcium is actually low. So the third patient with the calcium of 8.9 and the PTH of 93, that will get referred to me as normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism, but it's but it's not because the calcium is not truly normal. Calcium of 8.9 is low. So <clears throat> a lot of times what's called normal calcemic is not really normal calcemic. Um, when I diagnose it, it's when the calcium is truly normal, meaning it's in the mid to high nines <clears throat> and the PTH level is consistently elevated, meaning multiple PTH levels above 100 usually. If it's less than 100, it may be, but it's more like this case of this 42-year-old with a 9.8 pH of 70. There may be something else going on, some, some issue with absorption, uh, something else happening that is not, not what I would call normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. It's more likely a secondary process. So <clears throat> when I talk to patients, I dedicate an entire session to normal calcemic just to going over it because there is a lot of confusion about, uh, about normal calcemic, uh, but basically you, you have to kind of rule out a secondary cause and make sure that you're looking at what is a true normal calcium level for that person's age. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, I wanna talk about some of the, the primary hyperparathyroidism misconceptions. Uh, three primary ones that I see a lot. <coughs> <clears throat> This is the big one, and it is perpetuated in lots of lots of articles that quote this. Misconception number one is that most patients with primary hyperparathyroidism are asymptomatic. This is not true. Um, if you treat enough patients with this, you'll see that they really they do have symptoms, and the symptoms improve with surgery. And I get the benefit of hearing about you know seeing them after surgery as well. Um, but they do have symptoms. Now they may not be the ones you're looking for. So <clears throat> reality is that most patients have nonspecific symptoms. So they have, they have fatigue, brain fog, insomnia. And at this point, you're thinking, I have all those things and I don't have parathyroid disease. It's true. Fatigue, brain fog, insomnia, they're really common throughout the population, but they're even more common in patients with parathyroid disease. And more convincingly, they tend to get better after surgery. So people do have more energy, they feel like they're thinking more clearly, and they sleep through the night better um, after surgery. <clears throat> but these are this, and this general malaise. A lot of patients will just say, I don't feel like myself, and I can't really describe it. Um, that's, a, that's a very common thing that I hear with parathyroid disease is that, you know, in the last couple of years, I'm not myself anymore. I don't want to do the things that I used to do. 
Um, and, and that's all from having a fairly mild elevation of calcium. Um, here is when I was uh, at the Norman Center, <clears throat> we took our the 20,000 patients and looked at the different symptoms. And so you can see here, uh, you know, the percentage of patients over here, the most common one obviously is fatigue. And yes, if you ask the population, about 20, 30% of people in the population are going to say, I'm tired. And I'm sure a lot of people on this talk are thinking, I'm tired. Uh, but but with parathyroid disease, you do see a significant number reporting significant fatigue, and they will state that it's different. It's now they, they get up in the morning and they feel tired and they go to work and they need a nap in the afternoon, which they never needed before. So it's new. It's not something that they've had for their entire life. And by the way, if they have had it for their entire life, I usually tell them it's unrelated. Um, if you've had this, if you've had fatigue for 50 years, I'm probably not going to be able to help it. But if you've had fatigue for the last two years, and that corresponds with your calcium level, it's likely related. Um, sleep difficulty is often characterized by waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to get back to sleep. So being able to sleep for a few hours and then waking up. Um, and then memory loss, decreased concentration. You know, these are all subjective cognitive dysfunction issues, but they're very common in these patients. <clears throat> um, and all of these you know, are likely related to that role of calcium level, calcium levels in the uh, in the central nervous system. Um, high blood pressure. So a significant portion of the population has high blood pressure, but not 50%. And it's it's about 50% for patients with parathyroid disease. Um, osteoporosis, one of the classic ones, about a third of about 40% of patients will get that. Um, and then some of the these, you know, kind of classic symptoms like the bones, stones, moans, groans, whatever it is. <clears throat> stones, kidney stones is only going to occur in about 20 something percent of patients. Uh, most patients with parathyroid disease are not going to get kidney stones. And then of course you can also get the proximal muscle weakness, which can be quite severe and make it hard to walk actually. Um, and then chronic kidney disease as well. So all of these things, these, these patients can get um, from lots of nonspecific symptoms to you know, pretty severe kidney disease, osteoporosis um, and, and weakness but primarily they're presenting with these nonspecific symptoms. And a lot of times, unfortunately, the symptoms are attributed to things like getting older. Um, they're attributed to uh, menopause because this is a disease that happens a lot to older women. Uh, the average age was 60 and, and uh, the, it's about three to one women to men. So a lot of patients happen to be going through menopause and a lot of these symptoms are attributed to menopause, but they do get, they better, do get better after. after. So if you exclude the nonspecific symptoms uh, and you only include things like chronic kidney disease, stage three and higher, kidney stones and osteoporosis, then 44% of our patients were, quote, symptomatic. But if you looked at everything else, then over 95% did report some symptoms from this. Uh, there are very few people who, who say, I feel totally fine and I have no issues. Um, some people will say, I feel totally fine and they have really severe bone loss. Um, that's symptomatic too, but most people will report some symptoms. <clears throat> and this has been shown in multiple studies that, that parathyroid disease really diminishes quality of life. Um, and parathyroidectomy reverses this. And this, this again, uh, has been shown in multiple studies. This is not just me making it up. Um, we did a survey of, of patients before and after. So two weeks before and then, and then three months after. Um, we got 70, 70, 700 over 700 paired responses. Um, and you can see these are the different aspects of quality of life. And all of them were significantly improved three months after surgery. Uh, the things that, you know, you might, things that you might expect, things like, okay, you know, energy, but emotional well-being, I mean, social functioning, I'm not sure that I really expected that to improve, but these people do feel a lot better. They feel like doing their regular activities again, and they feel like going back out and visiting their friends. So um, in general, in all these uh, aspects of quality of life, they feel a difference. Okay. Misconception number two is that mild hypercalcemia equals mild hyperparathyroidism. This is one that, um, that I kind of have been battling for years um, because it really affects patients. Uh, patients are often told they have uh, just mild, just mild disease, and so their their symptoms couldn't be due to it. Uh, I, they they hear that a lot, and it actually um, it it really takes a toll on them. <clears throat> Here's what the international workshop guidelines. Now, there's argument about whether or not it's truly international. It's really run by 
uh, a few people at Columbia uh, University, but I won't get into the politics of it. Um, but they, they, they submitted these guidelines and there's indications for parathyroidectomy for asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, again, I told you asymptomatic is kind of a weird term because a lot of these patients do have symptoms, um, but a lot of them get called asymptomatic if they have something that, you know, if, if they just report being tired, they usually don't get marked as being symptomatic. They just, the doctor will just say, you know, you're going through menopause, you're getting older, um, and they won't be listed as symptomatic. But so this is a guidelines for asymptomatic patients, which to me wouldn't include a whole lot. But uh, if you're just looking at those classic, you know, bones, uh, kidney stones, et cetera, uh, then, then they are asymptomatic. So guidelines, <clears throat> Cranium clearance drops. So if they hit the CKD stage three, uh, then they then they're indicated for surgery. If they have kidney stones, if they have a high urine calcium, um, if they have enough bone loss, um, if they are young, why that's in there, I don't know because most patients are older than that. Um, but and then this here ended up in the guidelines: calcium greater than one point zero milligrams per deciliter above normal. Why? Um, so <clears throat> in my in my practice, it seemed like that was really not all that significant. You know, why would it be, you know, why why does it matter if it's one milligram per deciliter above normal? Um, because really patients with just mild hypercalcemia can have severe parathyroid disease. So we looked at this, uh, we, we looked at all of our patients um, and their highest serum calcium level and, and patients undergoing uh, parathyroidectomy is just 20,000 patients. And if you look at their calcium levels, you can really split them uh, into above 1.0 milligrams deciliter, you know, above normal and uh, or above that and below that cutoff, right? That, that magic cutoff of one point above normal. Um, <clears throat> I grade these out because they're normal calcemic, kind of a different disease. But, uh, but here we have 10,000 patients that are calcium levels between 10 and 11.0. Again, this is their highest calcium level. And then another 9,600 between 11 and, and up. Um, very few patients have calcium levels of 13, 14, obviously, but there are usually a few. Um, but you can look at those patients. And so you can compare them. All those symptoms I mentioned before, you can compare. And they're pretty much the same. Uh, the, the levels of different things, you know, slight variations, but none of these differences are statistically um, significant or relevant. They're all pretty, pretty similar. Um, people with mild, you know, what we call mild hypercalcemia have the same amount of fatigue, same amount of sleep difficulty, same amount of bone pain and hypertension and chronic kidney disease and kidney stones. Um, so we're not, we're not seeing that have an effect, we're not seeing more severe disease with higher calcium levels. Um, and that was really all this study, you know, wanted to show was, look, it, it really, that level, that arbitrary number doesn't seem to really matter for patients. <clears throat> okay, um, so I'm getting close to seven, so I'll just kind of wrap it up, but patients with mild hypercalcemia don't need surgery. You probably know <laughs> where this is going, but you know the natural history of primary hyperparathyroidism is to have a decline in bone density, decline in renal function, increased symptoms, increased risk of all these other things and a decreased quality of life. And this, <clears throat> if you see my other uh, set of slides I have for this, I have all the, the sites, you know, the studies referenced. This is not me making this up. This, is, this has been shown. And parathyroidectomy can halt or reverse those symptoms and complications. I listed some of these here, but these are, this has been shown again and again uh, in big studies. So the reality is patients with what we might call mild disease do benefit from surgery. We know what happens with untreated parathyroid disease um, and stopping that can, we, we can actually prevent um, a lot of those side effects or reverse some of them. I mean, you can reverse the bone loss to some extent. Um, you can see improvements in kidney function, see improvements in creatinine after parathyroid surgery. Um, all of that has been, has been shown. Um, I do have to mention, you know, with parathyroidectomy, it's, it's an operation, so there are always complications, uh, but they're pretty rare. Hematomas uh, are uncommon. Recurrent lumenoidal nerve, these are the two big ones I'm always looking out for, but they're both pretty rare, um, and it does correlate with the experience of the surgeon. So uh, thankfully, I don't have um, many, many complications. 
If you're getting a subtotal parathyroidectomy, hypoparathyroidism is its own risk. This is a terrible condition that you don't want to have. Um, and so you, you want to be very, very careful not to do this. Um, <clears throat> there aren't really many medical therapies. Uh, there is watchful waiting. This is really only the option if somebody really wants it. So if somebody says, I absolutely do not want surgery ever, but I feel fine and my bones are fine, my kidneys are fine. Okay, you can keep an eye on it um, and, and see how you feel. And I have done that for people where they just, you know, they just don't want surgery and, um, you yeah, know, we can, we can wait it out. Um, Sensapar is really only for very severely high calcium that you can't get down uh, before surgery. So uh, if you've got a calcium, if somebody's getting admitted to the hospital because their calcium is 14 and they keep becoming, you know, obtunded, uh, give them Sensapar temporarily uh, to get that calcium down and then, and then schedule surgery. Um, and also if they've had multiple failed operations and their calcium is still really high, Sensapar is an option. But for most people who have the mild um, hyper, hypercalcemia, um, the Sensapar is probably not going to help a whole lot. Uh, it can help with certain symptoms, but doesn't help with bone disease, for example. And so I usually don't really recommend it. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, there's lots more to talk about, <laughs> and I could talk all night about it, but I won't for your sake. Um, <laughs> but if you have any questions, I love talking about this, so please contact me. Um, that's my email address, and my the website's on there. I have a practice website and a patient Q&A site where they can post questions, and I, I will post answers. Um, but anyone can reach out to me, and, and I'd, I'd love to stop by and, and chat about parathyroid disease. So are there